Well, last week we began a series uh, through the book of James called Put Up or Shut Up. And I realize that's a, that's a little bit provocative, but so is the book of James. And so it kind of matches with a little bit of uh, what goes on in the book. The reason for the title will become clear throughout the series, but the bottom line is that James is really hard on hypocritical Christians. But there's not any more of those left in the world or in our church for sure. So, but anyway, we'll just talk about it in kind of the third person and think about how it might apply to other people. I'm just teasing. But last week we looked at verse 1 where James opens his letter with this greeting. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered among the nations, greetings. We also discussed at length the considerable implications of the fact that James was the earthly brother of Christ, second oldest son of Mary and Joseph. What would it take for James, who grew up with Jesus, to now refer to him as uh, himself as a bond slave, that's what the word there is, doulos, a servant, a, a bond slave, and then to call him, the one he's a bond slave to, the Lord, which is, is a, a, a deity reference, the Lord Jesus Christ, which is to identify him as the Messiah, the one sent to save the world, this, this one who he grew up with, to be able to make that kind of a truth claim about him. Now, for more on all of that, you'll have to look up last week's sermon on YouTube. We also post them on Facebook, and, and, and there's a podcast, if you prefer that, on our website. Today, in part two, we're going to get into the actual body of the letter. But first, in an attempt to help us identify with the historical context of James, I want to ask you to visualize something with me for a moment. Imagine that as if in a scene from some modern science fiction, science fiction television show, like, oh, I mean, this is an old one, but Lost or, or Fringe, or I don't know what the latest ones uh, are now, but there's all these kind of shows like this. And somehow, uh, all the people of Go Church, uh, you and me together, are warped into an, an alternative reality or a multiverse situation, if you will, where... Christianity is completely unknown. Imagine that the established religion of that place is powerful and sees what we believe about Jesus as a threat. Imagine that the government does not tolerate new religions. And as I said, we are new. Now also imagine that we are so excited about Jesus that we can't shut up about him. Therefore, they immediately find out about us. The religious leaders, therefore, team up with the government to wage war against our small band of Christ followers. Imagine that some of us are killed and many are put into prison. Imagine that somehow we still have the courage to maintain our faith and continue to meet as a church in spite of serious threats against us. But then an elite task force is a sign to put an end to our dangerous sect of religion. They are done putting up with us. They are finished playing around. And so this task force shows up on a Sunday morning and makes a display of torturing to death one of our leaders right in front of us. Picture this leader as someone who we all know and love, someone who works hard serving this church and helping it to be the wonderful church that it is uh, through their giving heart and their hard work. Picture Frank Myers. <laughs> After all, he is a deacon, and he's been with us from the beginning, and he's all the things I said. But as Frank dies, sorry, Frank, <laughs> it's, I'm just making this real. But as, as he dies, picture him continuing to verbalize his commitment to Jesus as Lord and Savior. With the powerful government behind them, these religious leaders yell at us to disperse from the building. As we run mourning and for our lives, we can hear them shouting, they will hunt us down one by one. We know they know where we live. And after seeing them arrest and kill others, even dragging them from their homes, we decide to split up and flee to places like Mexico and Canada. 
Maybe small pockets of us are able to stay together, and when we arrive in our new towns, while trying to keep a low profile, we begin to share about Christ with people who have never heard of him. Picture the people of Go Church dispersed and spread out into the communities. Nobody even knows where everybody went. Now imagine that in the aftermath of this, God inspires me as your pastor to send out a letter hoping it finds you wherever you are. Imagine that I was there when the persecution started and that I've nevertheless remained here at Ground Zero, that we all know I could be arrested and killed at any moment, but I'm still here. Imagine that this letter is sent around the world until eventually a copy comes to you, wherever you've settled. Now, if you were able to visualize that scene with me, you have personalized the historical context of the book of James. Because that was very much the situation on the ground as James wrote. And of course, the analogy fails at some point because while I am a pastor like James, unlike him, I am not the earthly brother of Jesus Christ, nor did I witness his resurrection, nor am I authorized to compose inspired scripture. So any letter I would write would not be authoritative in that way, but hopefully you get the idea. Most Bible scholars think James was written before 50 A.D. Many place the writing of this book at less than 10 years after the crucifixion, some even less than five years. Some consider it to be the earliest book in our New Testament. I won't go into all the clues that, that point to an early date for James, but it does seem clear that Jesus had not been gone long when he wrote it. That means that at the writing of this letter, the church was in its earliest stages, and it also means that at this point, the church would, would have been made up mostly of converted Jews. James was likely written before or at the very beginning of the Gentile conversion before the missionary efforts of the Apostle Paul. That is why James addresses this letter to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. These dispersed Jewish converts to Christianity were being persecuted at this point by the unconverted Jewish establishment. And they were doing so in some cases with the help of the Roman government. There was a new diaspora, as we discussed last week. And this time it was a dispersion made up of Jews who had accepted Jesus as Messiah. Because of persecution in Jerusalem and Judea, they had been scattered out into the surrounding nations. Let's take a look at the real scene on the ground, which I was paralleling in my illustration. This is what it was like for these early Jewish Christians. There was this Christ follower named Stephen. He was a caring spiritual leader among these early Christians, even ordained or set apart to be one of the first group of seven deacons. Why was he set apart? Because people saw his servant's heart and, he, and his spiritual maturity. Deacon is a word that simply means servant or minister. Stephen was on fire for God. Some of the Jewish leaders envied him and did not like his message. He was able to use Old Testament prophecies to show that Jesus must be, in fact, the Messiah. This had to be stopped. So the religious establishment forced Stephen to appear before the Jewish high council where he shared an amazing testimony for Christ recorded in Acts chapter 7. But rather than be convinced, they hated him all the more. Keep in mind, these same people who Stephen stood before had been responsible for crucifying Jesus and putting other early Christian leaders to death as well. He knew his number was up. He knew it was time to die for Jesus. However, this did not stop him from sharing the truth with them. After his powerful message, this is what happened. Verse 54 of Acts chapter 7. When they heard this, they were furious, these religious leaders. They gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God <clears throat> and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this they covered their ears. And yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city, and began to stone him, literally to kill him with rocks. <clears throat> Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep, and Saul was there giving approval to his death. Watch this. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem, 
and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Scattered, there's that word, that diaspora word. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him, but Saul began to destroy the church, going from house to house. He dragged off men and women and put them in prison. Those who had been scattered, diaspora, preached the word wherever they went. So here's what we need to take away for today's message. The believers were running for their lives, literally. They left their homes and scattered religious refugees. Following the martyrdom of Stephen, this group of believers in Jerusalem, which already numbered at least 10,000, scattered to various places, starting with Judea and Samaria, and then spreading out from there. They scattered so they would be harder to find. They fled the kind of persecution that could mean death or imprisonment, which, by the way, usually included torture. They didn't deny their faith, but they did disperse. And you see, this is the point in time where Pastor James writes his letter. Now, obviously, this letter gained a much larger audience eventually, and indeed, we are part of that audience today. But it is also important to understand the original audience as we seek to interpret why James says what he says. His original audience, in the narrowest sense, was a group of several thousand Jewish believers in Christ who had scattered following the murder of Stephen. James' original audience were those running from Saul and probably others who were hunting them down like convicted criminals. Remember from last week that this James, this earthly brother of Jesus, had become the spiritual leader, the pastor of this church before they scattered. And now he writes them a letter. Also keep in mind that the persecution from the Roman government was on the rise already at this time, beginning at least to find traction. The worst was yet to come. But Nero's atrocities began in the 60s, and there was persecution long before him. Rumors were invented and false information was spread until this group, later called Christians, was starting to be considered a threat to public safety. And that's when the otherwise tolerant Romans decided to become intolerant of Christianity. So this is the context for the letter of James, the brother of Jesus, the leader of what had become the church in exile. He wrote to something like an underground church. They often had to meet in secret but that didn't stop them from preaching the gospel to the people who hadn't heard at the risk of their own lives. These scattered Christ followers had been misunderstood, maligned, lied about, and they were soon to become public enemy number one. And yet instead of turning inward and hating the world for hating them, they continued to share the grace and love that was their real message until the eventual turning of the tide. Until finally, after great effort, suffering, and loss of life, they began to reverse public opinion, but that not even in their lifetimes. James knew what they faced. He knew. He knew what they were going through. He knew suffering and peril was upon their doorsteps. He faced the same thing. Maybe even more so being a high-profile Christian leader still based in Jerusalem. Keep in mind that not very long after he wrote this letter, James was martyred. The dispersion of the church had been no false alarm and no overreaction. His letter comprised, likely, his final words to the now scattered church that he had pastored. Understanding this scene makes the opening topic of the book of James even more poignant. We are now prepared to look into the body of his letter from verse 2. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. Greetings to you who have been displaced from your country by persecution under the threat of death. Consider it to be an awesome thing when you are being hunted down and driven out of your homes because you know it's going to develop perseverance. And that will help you become the person God wants you to be. That's essentially the way Pastor James opens 
his letter to the suffering saints at large, today Pastor James would have been fired for insensitivity. But let's see what we can learn. First of all, understand this. Perseverance is the ability to outlast hardship. Perseverance is the ability to outlast hardship. Now, I don't know about you, but the idea that enduring hardship or tough times is going to earn for me perseverance is not all that motivational. It's really kind of cyclical, isn't it? It's like, yes, if I put up with pain and keep putting up with it and, and put up with some more of it, then eventually I'll get to the point where I can put up with even more pain. Yippee. Reminds me of what my Marine Corps dad always said. It'll make you tough. It'll make you tough. If I heard him say that once, I heard it 10,000 times. Make you tough. And my kids, his grandkids, heard it more like as a joke. But when I was younger, it was not a joke, folks. He was serious. And he was right. But in the middle of it, I always wanted to say, if this is what it takes, I don't want to be tough. But little did I know that dad was quoting scripture all those years. No idea. Truth is, most of the time, I just didn't see all that much value in becoming tough. But James goes on to explain what dad was getting at. James tells us not just that we earn perseverance through trials, but he tells us what the, that perseverance gains as well. Look at the end of verse 4. He says, when perseverance finishes its work, you will be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Oh, that's all? Mature and complete, not lacking anything. What are we really talking about here? In a word, I think we're talking about contentment. Ever had it? What is the reward of perseverance? What does it mean to be mature and complete, not lacking anything? It means you've gained contentment, satisfaction, true happiness, joy, peace that can't be shaken. Now, that's something worth having, isn't it? If you think about it, maybe that's the only thing worth having. Isn't contentment really what we're all looking for? We'll come back to that in a minute. I don't have points as such for this message. We're just going to walk through our text verse by verse and let God say what he's going to say. First, James says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Pure joy. The word translated as pure here actually means unmixed. Unmixed. Even though we're talking about going through hardship, we are to have joy because of the trial, and this joy is not to be mixed with grief. What a challenge. How could James have called these people who were going through so much? And how could God call you, through the inspired writings of James, to have pure, unmixed, undiluted joy when you face the worst trials of life? How could he have had the nerve to ask for such a thing? I mean, really. Notice that James addresses these scattered Christians as my brothers. The translation is correct with the gender, but it nonetheless is meant for both brothers and sisters. That's the intent. This is a term of endearment for the church. As, as I might say, my dear church family. James is reminding them and us that we are all in this together. That as Paul put it, we are capable of sharing in the sufferings of Christ. Together. And see, this special kind of fellowship comes in part due to the fact that we have a different perspective on difficult circumstances than does the rest of the world. James uses the phrase, my brothers, no less than 15 times in his letter. And nearly every time he does, he's about to say something very challenging. Something we'll notice throughout our studies that James always couples his challenging commands with a call to fellowship. We are in this thing together as brothers and sisters in Christ, says Pastor James. Still, with or without brotherly language, 
How can James ask such a thing? That they should consider their horrible trials to be pure joy. Well, for starters, he asks nothing that Jesus didn't also ask. In fact, this is not an original idea for James. Where did this idea come from? Here in verse 2 is the first of many times in James where we are going to hear echoes of Jesus. And specifically echoes from his most famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. What did Jesus say? Matthew 5, verse 10. Blessed are those who, by the way, blessed means just overjoyed, made happy by God, made joyful by God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Jesus says, rejoice and be glad when you're persecuted. James says, consider it pure joy when you are persecuted. And what is the reason? Why should we rejoice and be glad and consider it pure joy when facing persecution and trials? Jesus says, because great is your reward in heaven. What does James say? Well, he says something about maturity and contentment. But if we look ahead to verse 12 of chapter 1, we actually discover his ultimate statement about persecution, which is right in line with what Jesus said. In verse 12, James writes, Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. Now that's a pretty similar statement to what James said, isn't it? To what Jesus said. We're going to find out through this series that the teaching of James lines up perfectly with the teaching of the one he addressed in his opening as the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. This is part of why it was important for me to explain last week that James grew up with Jesus. He spent the better part of three decades with him, learning from him. And so we should not be surprised at all when the teaching of James sounds like something someone who spent a lot of time with Jesus would say. Don't miss the point from both Jesus and James. Get this and get it good. The ultimate reason, the ultimate reason to have joy in persecution or trials is because there is an inversely proportional relationship between suffering on earth and the rewards of heaven. If we really believe that, it'd change everything. The mature believer gains a perspective that says, hey, the more I go through here, the more I'm going to gain the perspective to get pumped up about paradise. This is not where I want to be. It's not where I'm going to be. For eternity, the trials of this life make me joyful because they drive me to look forward to the eternity Jesus has promised to me. In fact, persecution is the guarantee of his promise. Hear that? Persecution is the guarantee of his promise. That's exactly the way all these passages read. Persecution is the guarantee of his promise. That's what James and Jesus are driving at. Consider it pure joy when you're persecuted because it's only a reminder of the promise of his reward for those who are persecuted in his name. In other words, if we can allow our suffering to help us see into heaven. Remember Stephen? He could see into heaven at the worst moment. If we can allow our suffering to help us see into heaven and look forward to the heavenly rewards being earned, then we will find our joy and our contentment even on this earth. Now look back at verse 2 once more. What does James mean when he says trials of many kinds? The Greek word here literally would be translated as manifold or multicolored or multifaceted. And the trials we face are multifaceted, aren't they? According to Scripture, some of our trials or difficulties actually come from God, sent by Him in order to help us grow. Other trials do not come from God but are the result of the evil choices of others, or even from our invisible enemy, Satan. Some trials come because we're Christians living in a lost world, while others are simply because we're humans, living in a broken physical and emotional condition until Jesus returns to make all things new. We all live in dying bodies with dying minds. That fact brings many trials of its own, doesn't it? Still other trials are in the category of temptations, which, though not from God, 
can still be used by him as a part of the refining process, particularly as we overcome. Our trials truly are of many different kinds, and they can come from many different sources. James is saying, whatever the source, whatever the reason, whatever the type of trial, consider it pure, unmixed joy. And why? Because this whole mess of messiness is earning for you a crown that is as multi-jeweled as your trials are multifaceted. The crown of eternal life is worth the perseverance required to get there. And what do we have to persevere? Basically, this passing vapor of a life. So short compared to eternity. Theologian Warren Wearsby says, the trials of life they're like variegated yarn that the weaver uses to make a beautiful rug. He talks about his visit to a world-famous weaver and watching the weaver's hired men and women work on the looms. He'd noticed that the undersides of the rugs were not very beautiful at all. The patterns were obscure, the loose ends of yarn dangled. Don't judge the worker or the work by looking at the wrong side, their tour guide told me. In the same way, we find ourselves looking at the wrong side of life. Only God can see the finished pattern ahead of time. We should not judge him or his work from the backside of an unfinished product. Now, I'm actually going to wrap this sermon up. Um, we're gonna, it's going to be to be continued for next week. But right now, I want you to think about your life for a minute. And I want you to understand that until you turn your life over to Jesus, none of what I taught today applies. See, until you hand God the keys to your heart, you're pretty much on your own. You're on your own. And your trials really aren't earning you much at all. But Jesus died on the cross so you wouldn't have to be on your own. He lives to be your bridge to God. He paid for your sins and your sinfulness. He is God, and by faith in Him, you can come to know God. <laughs> Without Him, you're alone, a speck in the cosmos. That means your life is really tiny, it's pretty random. But Jesus promised his followers something better. He said, in this world, you will have trouble. But take courage. Because I've overcome the world. What does that mean to you? In this world, you will have trouble. But take courage, for I have overcome the world. If you're not one of his, that really should provide no comfort at all. Because it was a promise to his own. If you're not one of his, your tough stuff isn't really earning you anything. And it's pretty much meaningless. If you're not his, you'll not be receiving that heavenly crown that James talked about. Your trials aren't earning you rewards in heaven if you're not on your way there through faith in Christ. James writes his letter to followers of Jesus, you see. Others who have said, Jesus Christ is my Lord. I'm his bond slave. The promises of the Bible are for his children. And you become his child by receiving his gift of forgiveness and peace, also known as grace. How do you receive it? By faith. Have you believed enough to ask Christ to be your Savior so that you can count on him to ultimately save you? From what? <laughs> the trials that are this life. Would you rather have the trials of this life end in nothingness or really worse? Or would you rather have the trials of life, this life, lead to a crown and rewards in heaven? James and Jesus made it clear. 
It's faith in Christ that makes the difference. What are you waiting for? Do you really think you can make life better for yourself on your own? I don't know about you, but as I get older, just kind of as far as that, just the, the, the world and, and, and my life, if I didn't have a future in heaven, it kind of gets worse. I don't know in a lot of ways. Can you really make it better on your own without God? You can't. And no, he doesn't promise a perfect life now, but he does promise paradise forever to his own. Your trials can become tools in the hands of God that can lead to contentment here as well as heavenly reward, but only when you surrender your life to him. If you're your own God, he isn't. It's today the day. Would you bow your heads with me as I just spend a moment in prayer? Is today the day? Would you want to turn your heart over to God? Would you want to surrender to Christ? Are you done trying on your own? Would you be willing to, to make him your Savior and Lord today? The, the one who you would think of as your master. To be his, his bond slave. Would you, learn, would you want to today start living for him instead of for yourself? It goes against our flesh. It goes against just our nature to do that. But he's God. And that nature that's making you not want to surrender to him, that's called sin. That's our sin nature. And you've got to repent from that. You've got to turn away from that. You've got to turn to him. It has to be real. Would you do it right now? Would you just tell him in your heart? Just say yes. I need you. I'm done. I need to follow you. I want to follow you. Take my life. Take my heart. I know you're not promising me a perfect life without trials. In fact, you've promised me I'll have trials. But I also know that I'm believing that you could use those things to make me more like Christ that prepare me for the rewards of heaven. That's the life I want to live. I want this life. Just tell him right now, I want this life to be about you. I want this life to be about preparing for eternity in heaven. And I want to pass the test, and I can't do it without you. Just tell him, Jesus, be my Lord, be my Savior. Do it today. Don't waste another day. Don't waste another trial, another hard time. Surrender. That's what it takes to be saved. Surrender. You got to believe enough to surrender. If you really believe Jesus was God, that he came here and died on a cross for you, if you really believe that, there's no other response but surrender. There's no way you can have true faith and not surrender. I don't believe you can. So you really believe in such a way that you could commit to him, that, that that's the kind of faith that you're deciding today to turn your heart to him, say, take the keys, Lord, my life is yours. Starting today. Father, I, I, as I turn my heart to another direction here, I, I, I today I've had to, I've constantly been aware and thinking about some of our brothers and sisters in places like China and all around the world that are, that are facing persecution that we have never even dreamed of. We've said we'd be willing. That's the kind of faith we have, and we, we hope that by your grace we could, we could face the kind of things that, that, that the early Christians faced and that some people in other countries that right now are facing and that some of us think could be coming here in our lifetimes. We've said we're willing, Lord, but we, we're not in the middle of it, but some of our brothers and sisters are. And I lift them up. Lord, help them. Give them the strength, Lord. Move, let your spirit give them the power to overcome. Help them be like Stephen, to keep their eyes on heaven and, and even to continue to have a forgiving heart like you did on the cross. Lord, use those tests, and I know your word is so clear that those who are persecuted receive greater reward. And so help them to look forward to that. Help us, Lord, to be real about our Christianity, to follow you in ways that mean persecution. We protect ourselves so much. Help us follow Jesus better. 
just keep working in our lives, Lord. We don't want just another church of people that just kind of, I don't know, check the box that we went to church that week. We want to be your people. We want to follow Jesus. And that's going to mean real stuff, tough stuff. We're going to need you to help us through. So help us, Lord, in Jesus' name.